<laughs> Thanks. So spin polarized bond states in semiconductor, superconductor, ferromagnetic insulator islands. Thank you, Gil. Uh, good uh, afternoon and good evening to everyone. Uh, thanks to, to the organizers for the invitation, and uh, I'm quite excited to present to you our latest study of the spin polarized bound states uh, in our triple hybrid uh, material and uh, the Coulomb spectroscopy thereof. Um, the experiments were done together uh, with Charlie Marcus uh, on material uh, developed by Yu Lu and Peter Krogstrup, and uh, our experiments were then supported also by the theory developed by Ruben Sonesauto, Carson Flensberg, and Martin Leinze. Uh, I would like to start by a short motivation, and uh, basically this brings me back to the two seminal papers that were essentially put together back to back in 2010, and uh, they argued that a combination of spin orbit coupled uh, uh, spin orbit coupling with a Zeeman field may lead to the formation of a helical electron liquid in a single channel. And then, when such wires are situated in proximity to a conventional S wave superconductor, Majorana bound states are formed. Here is an illustration of such a scenario when a semiconducting wire is placed in a magnetic field. The, in a single channel model, in a simplistic case, you can uh, position yourself in the helical gap and then uh, have spin polarization. And if you couple such a wire to an S wave superconductor, magical red balls appear at the ends of the wire. And they represent, in this case, the Majorana mode. Um, the density of state spectrum of such a wire as a function of position along the wire looks as follows. The, at the ends of the wire, there you can find two localized uh, zero energy modes gapped out by, by the superconducting gap. And inside of the wire, there is no density of states, again, in theoretical model. Uh, these Findings, you know, the, the topological promise motivated uh, development of new kind of materials, and uh, in particular the epitaxial growth of the semiconductor and superconductor nanowires. Uh, while there are multiple uh, ways to, to do such a uh, uh, to, to, to comprise such a system, in this work uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, the method uh, uh, which is uh, dubbed vapor liquid solid. And here I'm just showing you an illustration how uh, these nanowires are grown. Um, this is the end of the wire, uh, TM imaged um, in situ during the growth. And you see this ball. This is not a Majorana in this case. This is a gold catalyst, which basically collects the vapor 3-5 material from the surroundings, surrounding, liquefies it. And then uh, when, when it gets saturated, it solidifies it and forms uh, the uh, epitaxial material layer by layer. So these wires are grown to a certain length, most of the time something like 10 micrometers. And then you can also deposit a superconductor, and in our case it's aluminum, uh, on either part uh, of the wire or a, a full shell of the wire. Um, in this talk, I'm going to be mostly talking about the partly coated wires. And the trick is to deposit this uh, superconductor in, uh, in situ without breaking the vacuum such that the indium arsenide, uh, which is our semiconductor, indium arsenide interface remains uh, pristine and oxide free. And this is the epitaxial interface that uh, we are dealing with. Uh, these wires can be individually fabricated into uh, devices, tunneling spectroscopy devices, where part of the aluminum is removed such that you can place a normal lead at the end of the wire. The other end is grounded. And uh, between the hybrid superconductor and the normal lead, we leave a short segment of bare semiconductor where we apply uh, gate voltages to form tunneling barrier, allowing us to probe the local density of states at the end of the wire. Usually we also put some gate electrodes next to the wire that allow us to tune the chemical potential or electron charge density in the wire. Um, here's an example spectrum measured at zero applied magnetic field as a function of source strain voltage and um, these two gates tuning the charge density in the wire. 
um, you can see around 200 microelectron volts uh, a constant uh, parent gap that doesn't change and does not depend on these gate voltages. But uh, at specific gate voltages, you uh, also can identify subgap states that hang below the parent aluminum gap. If you now apply a uh, magnetic field to, uh, to the wire parallel, we can spin split these uh, subgap states. Um, and then if you keep increasing uh, the magnetic field, these subgap states eventually can cross zero energy and each other. Uh, and in some cases, they stick uh, to zero energy. Um, if I take a cut here around the minimum of the subgap state, um, we see the evolution of the magnetic field of the subgap states in the magnetic field. So at, at low magnetic field, the subgap states split, and around one Tesla or so, they cross zero energy, and then um, they can either, you know, um, split, or in some cases, as shown here, um, in more exotic cases, uh, they can stick to zero energy. So this is one way of probing the subgap state energy in these nanowires, namely the tunneling spectroscopy. Another Another way is a Coulomb spectroscopy that I also want to introduce a little bit in more detail. And then, um, sorry, uh, these wires are essentially identical, except now the device geometry is slightly different in the sense that not, you have the tunneling barrier not only on one side, but on both sides of the nanowire, which allows it to form a Coulomb island. In this case, the energy of the island is described by a set of parabolas, uh, which can be, um, so, so here is the, the simplistic uh, approximation of the island energy, where you have the charging energy, uh, uh, charge, gate-induced charge offset, uh, the occupancy of the island, and then the parity of the subgap state at energy E0. The parity meaning that if, if there is an even number of electrons, uh, Pn is equals to zero, whereas if there is odd occupancy of the island, uh, the Pn becomes one. Going, coming back to the parabolas, the, the, the changing the gate voltage or in, in this model, the charge, uh, in, uh, gate induced charge offset, the islands, uh, the island can be charged in units of two electrons because in this case, the charging energy uh, is smaller than the superconducting gap or the lowest energy state. And so the, 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 the island is charged in portions of Cooper pairs. And then at the degeneracy points between these two even occupancy parabolas, we get a Coulomb blockade uh, peak uh, when we measure the conductance through the island. Here is the color map of, uh, of this um, 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 as a function of source. Was I muted? Not sure what happened here. Um, yes, but now you're back. Great. Um, good. Now, if we apply magnetic field to the system, the subgap state, as shown before, spin splits, and then uh, decreases in energy, at least one of the branch. And once, once the odd parity parabola decreases below the charging energy, we can, uh, the, the island is able to be oddly occupied, which effectively spins, uh, sorry, uh, which effectively splits these Coulomb peaks. And then we start seeing the odd Coulomb diamonds. Finally, if you keep increasing the magnetic field, the subgap state uh, decreases to around zero energy, and then we uh, end up having one e periodic Coulomb blockage. If uh, we take uh, a cut at zero voltage bias and measure it uh, and plot it as a function of magnetic field, we see how the Coulomb blockade peaks uh, evolve from T periodicity to even odd and eventually one e periodicity. And then we can call the Coulomb peaks, uh, the spacing be be between the Coulomb peaks, the even uh, peak spacing and odd peak spacing. And it turns out that the subgap state energy, the minimum of the odd parabola, is proportional to the difference of these subgap state, uh, of these peak spacings. And we can use those to extract the subgap state energy. 
So this is slightly, seems like a slightly complicated uh, way of measuring subject state energy, but the resolution that you can resolve is much higher and is uh, complementary to the tunneling spectroscopy. So these are the two tools that we use in the lab quite often to probe the uh, subject state energy uh, in these hybrid nanowires. In parallel, or actually slightly before the two popular proposals that I introduced before, another proposal was put forward that argued that just like the SA of superconductivity, the Z1 coupling can also be proximity induced in, in the film, and they mean the semiconducting film, by an adjacent magnetic insulator. So this is the idea. You have a semiconductor proximitized by the superconductor and magnetic insulator on either side, and uh, effectively we recover this uh, helical gap that can also be used for inducing topological superconductivity in these systems. They also did some uh, uh, simulations and uh, argued that a certain fraction of each low energy wave function penetrates the insulator, leading to an effective Zeeman field induced by the prox proximity effect. So, um, but the question now remains, how big is the effective field that uh, we can achieve in such a system? Searching through the literature a little bit, going uh, to as early as uh, 80s, I found that uh, an experiment on europium oxide uh, aluminum uh, bilayers, and uh, where, where the uh, finding was that the thin films of aluminum in contact with uh, films of the ferromagnetic semiconductor europium oxide behave like BCS superconductors with an internal magnetization. Their model is that the exchange coupling between the europium oxide and aluminum spin splits the uh, density of states in the superconductor that can be uh, approximated by the Zeeman energy. And uh, fr fr from the uh, um, peak splitting, you can extract the effective magnetic field. And that's what we did. They measured the tunneling spectroscopy of the system. And at finite applied magnetic fields, they found that the effective magnetic field greatly exceeds uh, um, the applied field, basically by uh, me measuring the splitting of the coherence peaks. Another experiment now uh, slightly more recently uh, found similar results, and uh, okay, but in this case now on europium sulfide, not oxide, uh, bilayers together with aluminum, uh, they found that the Zeeman splitting of the coherence peaks gives a direct measure of the Zeeman uh, field, just like argued in the previous work. And by measuring it as a function of um, a magnetic field, they were able to map out the magnetization or the effective field that the aluminum feels, uh, the aluminum feels, and then they found the, this hysteretic loop, depending on the sweep direction of the external field. And mainly what I'm trying to show here is that the magnetization that they found, reminiscent magnetization that they found, at zero magnetic field exceeds one Tesla. So uh, this looks like an interesting system to study. Um, uh, as I showed before in the tunneling spectroscopy data to spin split and bring the subgap states to zero energy, we need magnetic fields of around one Tesla. Uh, it seems like europium sulfide in combination with aluminum can provide it to us. And this motivated us to develop a new system similar to the aluminum indium arsenide uh, epitaxial wires. But in this case, we also include a europium sulfide film in between the two materials. And uh, in this work uh, led by Yu Liu and Peter Krogstrup's group, the, uh, they showed that uh, the system is epitaxial in, 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 in all cases in between indium arsenide, europium sulfide, and aluminum. And, uh, um, um, looks like these wires are quite quite nice um, from the material perspective. So we continued with them and um, started by investigating the properties only of the superconducting shell. So we took a single nanowire and contacted it with four normal leads, uh, allowing us to measure the voltage drop uh, along the superconducting shell as a function of current bias and parallel magnetic field. Notice that here are no weak links or anything, so it's really just the uh, properties of the superconducting shell where the semiconductor acts as a substrate, if you will. Cooling this wire down, 
and measuring the differential resistance, so dV, dI, we found that the critical temperature at zero applied magnetic field is around 0 0.8 Kelvin, which compared to the bulk of the aluminum, the critical temperature is 1.2 Kelvin, so it's already decreased, indicating that europium sulfide is probably doing something to the aluminum. And uh, in particular, for the thin aluminums that we are using, we actually would expect the critical temperature to be even higher because there is an experimental um, uh, finding essentially that the critical temperature and the gap of the aluminum increases with the decreasing thickness. Anyhow, uh, the differential resistance of the shell as a function of current bias and a parallel magnetic field uh, shows the following dependence. Here, the black corresponds to the superconducting state where the color is the resistive state. Um, starting at negative 50 millitesla, the superconductivity is suppressed but revives quickly and then uh, increases towards uh, the magnetic field zero and keeps increasing actually when we pass the zero, this is uh, roughly where the zero is, uh, spikes around positive 10 millitesla drops abruptly and then smoothly decreases again and diminishes around 50 millitesla. Picture inverts itself when we sweep the magnetic field the opposite way. We find that the spike of the superconductivity or in the supercurrent essentially, a critical current uh, is around negative 10 millitesla on the other side of the zero. And this indicates the hysteresis in the system implying that the aluminum is well proximatized by the europium sulfide, yet doesn't suppress the superconductivity fully. The question still remains though, how big is the effective field? And uh, after we took these measurements, we realized that we can effectively extract the effective field from the critical current measurements by the following procedure we can take the following dependence between the critical temperature as a function of magnetic field and uh, deduce it uh, from the critical current that I just uh, showed you before. And uh, by doing so, we get the following critical current uh, curves. We see that around zero uh, applied magnetic field, the critical temperature is uh, around 0 0.8 Kelvin, confirmed by the previous measurements and around uh, the coercive field, so plus minus 10 uh, millitesla, depending on the seep direction, the critical temperature spikes to 1.4 to 1.5 Kelvin. We can now take this critical temperature data and extract the Cooper pair breaking parameter alpha using this Abrikosov-Gorkov pair breaking theory uh, and the following relation uh, from that, sorry. Uh, this relation seems tedious um, as it has a logarithm of reduced temperature and digamma functions on the other side, but uh, it can be solved numerically uh, for a given alpha, and that's what we did. Uh, and uh, basically this gives you the alpha and then the energy scale of the Cooper pair breaking um, parameter um, corresponding to it. Now, what do we do with this alpha? We can neglect in the simple case, this is already slightly hand wavy, but we neglect the spin orbit coupling in the aluminum as it's a light material. And then we assume that the, this uh, pair breaking parameter is given by essentially Zeeman energy, where the magnetic field is the effective field that we are interested in. Uh, essentially the sum of the magnetization and the parallel applied magnetic field. And by this assumption, we can extract the following hysteresis loop from those data and then find that uh, similar to the uh, experiments from uh, other groups, the uh, effective magnetic field reminiscent at zero uh, applied field is roughly one Tesla. Great. Uh, so with those results, we also wanted to look at the proximity induced superconductivity and uh, the basically spin split superconductivity at the end of the nanowire. We fabricated the following geometry very similar to the previous uh, uh, tunneling uh, uh, device that I showed before, except here it has the tunneling barrier that crawls over the wire to increase the uh, lever arm. It also has the upper and lower uh, gate voltages to tune the density on both sides of the wire. And finally, it has a bag gate that extends under the wire and also the junction. So essentially it 
the voltage and the baggage uh, tunes both the charge uh, density in the wire, but also the coupling to the lead. If you take a conductance map for the device as a function of cutter voltage and the baggage, we see that uh, there's a crosstalk between the two gates, but essentially the device can be pinched off around one volt or so. Um, taking a cut uh, and for, for this uh, specific gate voltage and baggage as a function of cutter, we see that uh, as a function of source chain voltage, we see uh, that uh, the, the, the conductance from, from open regime through tunneling into the pinched off regime. In the open regime, the device displays and rev enhanced reflection. And in the pinch off regime, the transport is cut off. And finally, in the tunneling regime, uh, the spectrum represents uh, the density of states at the end of the nanowire right here. And what we find, again, for this specific gate voltage is that uh, there is a zero energy state um, extending uh, for a certain range of the cutter voltage and uh, uh, induced gap of roughly 50 microelectron volts, which is uh, strongly reduced compared to the bulk aluminum gap of 180 microelectron volts. If you take another cut in this map, now compensated uh, baggage sweep, so tuning the density of state uh, charge density in the nanowire, but compensated with the cutter to uh, maintain the same transparency. We find uh, how this zero bias peak forms. And so basically at the more negative side of the uh, baggage voltage, we, we see spins, uh, subgap state at finite energy that coalesce to zero energy as the baggage voltage uh, is swept, remains at zero energy for half a volt or so, and then splits again. You might also notice that there are some uh, sharper resonances here coming crossing and going zero. And those are, you can see visibly here as uh, lines perpendicular to the cutter axis, essentially saying that these states uh, are mostly depend on the cutter, indicating that they live only at the junction. And interestingly, the zero energy state doesn't seem to care too much about these crossings. In any case, to us, it seemed like these states are quite interesting in the context of um, topological superconductivity. But as uh, Elsa did the nice introduction to it and explanation, I'm going to skip and spare you the details and come to the results that I actually wanted to discuss. And those are the uh, Coulomb uh, uh, blockade in the islands made on the same wires. And in this case, we take the um, identical wire and fabricate two Coulomb islands next to it, but measure only one at a time. Similar to the previous device, uh, it has upper and lower gate voltage, but now again, two ba cutter barriers at either end that allow us to tune this island into a Coulomb uh, blockaded regime. And when we do so and measure the conductance of the device as a function of surgery and voltage and uh, upper gate, which is located on the aluminum side, uh, we, find, we find the following Coulomb blockade uh, pattern um, with uh, sequential tunneling lines. And, but in addition to that, we also see some um, steps in conductance at certain energies that alternate from uh, um, diamond to diamond. We associate these steps with inelastic cotling processes. And to understand them better, uh, we developed a theory uh, describing a transport through a spin polarized bound state. So in the odd occupied, uh, when the island is odd occupied, we have a single subgap state, or we consider a single subgap state uh, that can be occupied by a single spin, and the counterpart is spin split uh, and uh, is taken out of the picture essentially. In the odd sector, we have um, the subject state occupied where it's vacant in the even sector. And now that's the ground state and the system can be excited uh, by these two following mechanism uh, uh, of which transport I represent here. For example, in the odd sector, the electron can be excited above the continuum by 
exiting and letting another electron enter. Uh, and this costs you the energy difference between the superconducting gap and the subgap state. This energy is provided by the voltage bias of the source and drain. Similarly, a Cooper pair can be split up and put uh, and where both of the electrons are put to the continuum, uh, as shown here. The same can be done in the even uh, occupied, uh, uh, even occupancy. Similar to the auto occupancy, yet the, the subgap state is not occupied. So we can break up a Cooper pair, put one electron into the subgap state and the other electron into the continuum. And this costs less energy than the two, uh, two, two delta if the subgap state is present. So with these considerations, uh, um, Ruben simulated and calculated the, the spectrum. Uh, and uh, so, so essentially calculated conductance as a function of voltage and uh, gate and discharge offset shows uh, even odd pattern. And uh, these, these uh, cotoneling steps um, correspond to the inelastic transport and these excitations of the, um, of the system. Just to compare it with the data from the previous slides, uh, it seems that the, this theory represents uh, and depicts well the, the qualitative features of the island uh, of the experiment that we find. So basically we have two steps at um, energies that would correspond, for example, to delta plus epsilon or two delta uh, right here. If you consider not spin polarized, but spin degenerate bound state, the picture uh, changes considerably and actually becomes more complicated because the subgap state here can be occupied by two electrons and that opens more possibilities for the excitations. So in addition to the red and blue uh, excitations that we considered in the previous slide, in each of the occupancy sectors, we can have two additional excitations. And so I'll spare you the details going through the same exercise of the transport but essentially, uh, in the in in the Coulomb spectra, one expects to see uh, quite a few more um, cotoneling steps um, as a function of voltage, which we do not really see experimentally. Good. Uh, These results that I've shown so far are from a single island, but uh, we can also um, we also reproduce them in in other devices. Here is an example from a second uh, wire, sec second island, showing uh, uh, um, even odd Coulomb blockade. Um, and now, if we compare it to the model, we can assign the energy of the, these uh, cotoning features to, to specific uh, excitation um, 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 tr transport process and uh, extract the induced gap and the subgap state energy. In addition to that, we can also change the gate voltage. And if we change from, in this particular case, from 200 millivolts to zero, the Coulomb blockade evolves from even odd to uniform periodicity. And basically the consecutive peak, uh, uh, um, diamonds become um, nearly identical, indicating that the energy of the subgap state decreased to zero um, because the, the, the first cotton link feature happens at the same energy in both um, Coulomb diamonds. You can also look uh, at the longer island. So that one was 400 nanometers. We are now moving on to 800 nanometers. And we can also look at the bigger ranges of the gate voltages. In this case, uh, upper gate voltage on the aluminum side that tunes the occupancy of the island. And we see the Coulomb blockade that evolves from even odd through 1E to uh, even odd again. To help you look at these uh, cotoning uh, features, so, uh, I, I am going to draw some lines here. And then we can define these cotoning steps as the following uh, excitation uh, energies. And uh, using these energies, you can see that if, if we index each of the Coulomb diamond as one, two, one, two, we see that on the left side of the graph, the 
Coulomb diamonds with the index one are larger, whereas they become smaller on the right side of the graph. Uh, and now if we extract the subgap state energy from this data, we get the following picture. Uh, and we see that the subgap state energy crosses zero and therefore the C1 becomes smaller than C2. Um, in addition to that, we can imply, uh, um, employ the method that was used before introduced in the beginning of the talk, namely the peak spacing difference. And uh, comparing those two methods, we find that uh, the extracted subgap state energy agrees well between these two uh, models. Finally, we can compare uh, those data with the theory for a subgap state energy larger than zero, and we find that odd uh, diamond is smaller than the even diamond. If the subgap state energy is brought to zero, we find that uh, both of the diamonds are of the same size and the coddling uh, features align with each other. Uh, but if the subgap state energy decreases below zero, the um, odd diamond becomes larger than uh, than the even diamond in contrast to the opposite sign of the subgap state. Well, this brings me to the summary of my talk. Um, I showed to you that the indium arsenide aluminum europium sulfide can form a nice epitaxial triple hybrid uh, crystal. And then using these crystal to, to form Coulomb islands, uh, we find spectra that agree well with the models of inelastic cotyling through a, a spin polarized subgap state. Um, from the additional features of the spectra, we can imply that the induced uh, spin splitting of this subgap state is larger than the induced superconducting gap. And then finally, we can use these inelastic coddling features to, as a new means to probe the subgap state energy. Well, thank you and uh, for your attention. Thanks. It's an amazing experiment. Uh... Questions? Yes, Stefan. Maybe I'm not ready, though I already asked the first one on the last talk. Um, what I was wondering is. Uh, sorry, sorry, could you raise the volume a little bit? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, um, what I wanted to ask is uh, you said that the. Um, energy or uh, the gap rather reduces as you uh, include this uh, urban sulfide um, films. How does it compare to a magnetic field of the same strength as you get from this uh, magnetic insulator that you include? Because here you said it was like 18 or 50 uh, micro electron volt or so that you have left in terms of a gap when you include the European sulfide. Right, so uh, if I don't I include the, the, the European and I instead just put a magnetic field, what would be the? Um, I remember doing the estimation. So essentially for for um, this gap of 50 micro electron volts or so, uh, and the same thickness of aluminum, um, at, at zero magnetic applied fields, we expect to have a superconducting gap of around 230 microelectron volts. And here we have 50 microelectron volts. And um, it really depends if you assume if, um, if this is a topological phase or not. So basically, um, if it's actually uh, 180 microelectron volts difference between the gaps or 280 microelectron volts between the gaps. I don't want to do the speculation here. Um, I think it's less than one, one Tesla uh, if, if you take the difference of 180 microelectron volts. Um, but I don't remember exactly um, the field value that it would correspond to extract it this way. Yeah. I, actually, can one, maybe this is more of a theory question, but uh, I guess Carsten is still here, maybe. Um, can one estimate by how much one has to suppress the gap to actually be able to get uh, enough Zeeman effect to see my honors? Is there some more correlation that I actually have to suppress the supernatural gap to, to be able to see my honors? Um, I would assume so somehow because um, well, um, you, you, 
you don't have to, I think you don't have to suppress the parent gap. Essentially, what you're interested in is suppressing the induced superconducting gap. And if it's the induced gap of the single uh, channel, in best case, then uh, preferably you only couple the europium sulfide to that channel and not to the superconductor. In our case, experimentally, it's easier said than done. Um, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Yeah, I think it does. So basically, yeah, you don't really want to suppress the gap in the superconductor, but because the states that you want to turn into myelonas live close to the superconductor, I guess you have to. Yeah, make a yeah. I think so. Um, Thanks. Right. Thanks. Uh, so, Bert, do you have your hand up? Would you like to ask a question? No, I'm sorry. I, forgot. I just didn't put it down, I think, from last time. Sorry. Oh, no, no problem. So another hand from Brett. It's no longer there. Okay. Any other questions? I can scan quickly. I don't see any. If you would like to ask a question, go ahead and mute yourself and ask. And then uh, we can start. Um, uh, in the meantime, Jason can prepare to uh, share screen and uh, we can start the discussion maybe I, uh, part maybe of the I session. A, maybe I ask a quick question. Um, Go for it. It's more for a, for a theorist, but if you are in the topological phase and, and you have a Majorana at the end, can you say something about its localization in the, in the plane perpendicular to the wire? Um, is it, where, where would, the, would, would the Majorana be, be localized in this plane? We had the discussion about probing it maybe with STM at the end of the of the wire. So I was wondering. Do you but, mean it's but, localization laterally to the wire or or the basically the decay? No, laterally to the wire. So if I if I take a cut um, in the plane perpendicular to the wire, where would I uh, see the, the Majorana localized. I guess you have, you have the cross section right there in the middle of the slide. Is that, uh, is that the, the space that you want to ask about? Like where we're on the wire, we're yes, on the cross exactly. section of the wire. Yeah, near which corner, etc. Exactly. Um, I think there are calculations of that uh, profile, actually. Yeah, simulations. And actually, the, the position of the wave function of the Majorana, actually, you have to share somehow the European sulfide and the aluminum in order to get to topology. So it's very important that uh, the wave function will share across this cross section both the European sulfide and the aluminum. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to, to add something related also to the previous question. So you were asking if you need to close the, the, the gap in the superconductor, and the answer is clearly no. No, you, you want to be able then to proximitize the wire. So basically, uh, this is what I saw the, in, my, um, in my talk. Basically, you can have in the wire, you need the superconducting correlations, and you need uh, the, the magnetic correlations, and you can get them through two... Uh, let's say, ways. One is directly in the region where the um, European is. You get there some magnetic correlations. But then you can have the extra ones that come from the superconductor because all, there is also this proximity effect between the European and the aluminum. And this extra uh, indirect magnetization helps to uh, get the topological phase uh, better, to get uh, higher topological mini gaps and so on. Okay, yeah, I think uh, in my, my comment or question was more um, the way to think uh, more physically about how the state in the nanowire acquires all of the superconducting and magnetic properties. I would say is that basically part of the wave function leaks into the European sulfide and another part into the aluminum, right? And I guess yeah, you can't really have yes, that. Yes, that, that is what we're European. doing. Oh, sorry. That is what why we include in the numerical calculations, we include both the aluminum and the European 
uh, in the tight binding uh, calculations on the same footing because you want to have your wave function be able to enter the superconductor and also partly the magnetic insulator. So this right. is uh, indeed uh, necessary to, to get these proximity effects. And it happens exactly because it penetrates, yes. Yeah, but I, I guess my thinking from there is that uh, it's basically not possible to have topological states without the europium also affecting the other one, right? Well, in the, you saw probably in my in transparency is the case of the non-overlapping device when there was no uh, overlap between the europium and the superconductor. And there definitely is much more difficult to get a, a topological transition. So the phase diagram was had a, a much smaller regions with topology and the uh, gaps, the, induced, uh, the, the topological gaps were also uh, much smaller. But it was not impossible because at the end you could have a situation where the wave function is spread basically all across the, the cross section and could uh, get uh, uh, correlations from the superconductor in the regions where it is uh, close to that and also from the magnetic insulator. But of course, in this way, it, electrostatically, this was not very easy to find and the induced gap was much smaller. The wave function was really much more spread. Whereas in the overlapping device, you have the possibility of having the wave function close to both the European and the aluminum at the same time. And then the proximities are much uh, higher. Okay, thank you. So essentially, just, I think uh, it's a... Go ahead. Sorry. So. Uh, essentially, I think it's a self-consistent problem that, you know, uh, feeds back to itself, you know, in, in the non-overlapping wire case, um, if you fine-tune the gate such that you position the wave function in the corner between the europium sulfide and aluminum, the, the wave function itself in the semiconductor mediates the coupling between the aluminum and europium sulfide in a sense. So, yeah, it's a it's a intricate um, system, you know, interplay between these uh, all three crystals. Yeah, it is true that that is very interesting. And also, uh, it's also good that there is this band bending, uh, 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 which is uh, larger at the superconductor uh, layer, uh, because this, the, the wave function naturally wants to be there. So it wants to be at the corner where also the, the aluminum, the, the europium is also present. So electrostatically, yeah. it's much easier to get that situation, also because of the accumulation layer. So that, that corner is, is, <laughs> is very, yeah. it's a good situation. That's why the overlapping device is, is so yeah. good. This is a very informative discussion. Uh, I would like to thank again Sole and uh, the speakers of, speakers of the session. And let's move to the discussion with Jason, which we lead. So.